answer.
The committee will come to order. And without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. And without objection, members of the full committee, not on the subcommittee, are authorized to participate in today's hearing. This hearing is entitled Ending Debt Traps and the Payday in Small Dollar Credit Industry. And I just want to initially just apologize to my colleagues and to our panelists uh, for late arrival. I just, we had a Codell that had a little bit of problems. So we're just literally landing and getting in here. So, uh, but I thank you for your patience. Uh, I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. To Ranking Member Lukemeyer and members of the subcommittee, welcome to the hearing on ending debt traps in the payday and small dollar credit industry. This hearing gets at the heart of the intersection between Main Street and Wall Street. As was the case with our last hearing on CRA modernization, this hearing offers us an opportunity to consider the challenges faced by everyday American families, far too many of which struggle to make ends meet. According to a recent Federal Reserve report on the economic well-being of U.S. households, 10% of adults experience hardship because of monthly charges in income. Four in 10 adults cannot cover an unexpected expense of $400 without selling something or borrowing money. Over one-fifth of adults are not able to pay all of their current month's bills in full, and over one-fourth of adults skip necessary medical care due to financial hardship. These numbers paint a stark picture of the financial health and resilience of American households. Indeed, despite a growing economy, the data shows that middle-class and lower-middle-class American families are falling behind. The financial vulnerability the financial vulnerability of such a large segment of American households should not make them easy targets for predatory lenders. Congress and relevant agencies have an obligation to ensure access to financial products that do not wreck, the lives, do not wreck their lives and finances of our constituents. American workers deserve access to financial service products that can serve as a foundation to building a better future for themselves and their families. It is in this context that today's hearing considers payday loans, car title loans, and other small dollar loans products. Over a period of five years, engaging broadly with communities and stakeholders and reviewing over one million comment letters, the CFPB developed a payday rule aimed at curbing the most abusive practices of the payday industry, including requiring that payday lenders uh, assess borrowers' ability to repay. There is ample research that shows that the ability to repay combined with amortizing loans are key to protecting consumers from falling into debt traps. As such, it was deeply disappointing to see Mr. Mulvaney's first and then Ms. Uh, Kreninger, the current CFPB director, to move to rescind these key provisions from the payday rule and delay the rule itself. Congress established the CFPB in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act in the wake of the greatest financial crisis since the Great Depression, specifically so that financial services cons consumers would know they have one agency tasked with the sole mission of protecting consumer interests. It is hard to see how the actions of the Bureau under Mr. Trump's leadership, leadership team is fulfilling its core mission of putting consumers first. The testimony of the panel ex of experts today paints a portrait of the health and vulnerability of average American households and shines an important light on some of the worst predatory practices in payday, car title, and small dollar loans, um, in small dollar lending, and puts forward policy recommendations for our consideration. Today's witnesses will also speak to the important role of community banks and FinTech. These are important issues that need not be a partisan issue. All of us, as members of Congress, have constituents struggling to earn a living, finding themselves in a growing banking desert and caught in payday debt traps. Today's hearing is an opportunity to consider how best to serve these constituents. I very much look forward to discussing these issues further today with the panel of witnesses and members of the subcommittee. And with that, I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Luca Baia, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over the years, I've heard countless stories from my constituents who rely on small-dollar, short-term loans in times of financial hardship. 
Where there's an unexpected auto repair, hospital bill, or a broken air conditioner, many families simply have nowhere else to turn. Each year, more than 12 million Americans utilize small dollar loans when they need short-term financial assistance. Unfortunately, the reputation of the entire small dollar lending industry has been sullied by a few bad actors exercising deceptive lending practices. This small group has caused an industry that provides access to credit for millions of Americans to be villainized. In fact, under the previous administration, DOJ and FDIC officials specifically singled out payday lenders under Operation Choke Point and attempted to cut off these legally operating businesses from the financial services industry. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle will call for the payday industry to be severely regulated on the federal level and are proposing legislation that will place additional requirements on short-term loans. I would caution against this approach. History has shown that regulations have consequences. We have seen over the years traditional financial firms have largely gotten out of the small business or the, or the business of small dollar short-term loans due to the cost of regulations. This is clearly a demand, for, there, there is clearly a demand for short-term lending products, particularly to low and moderate income individuals. According to the Federal Reserve, four in 10 adults in 2017 would be forced to borrow, sell positions, or not be able to, to pay if faced uh, with a $400 emergency expense. Before this committee considers any legislation <clears throat> related to the requirements and regulations of short-term lending, we must fully examine how it will impact the industry and the consumers who depend on these products. I'm particularly concerned about a draft proposal before the committee today which would cap the APR at 36% for all consumer credit can transactions. First, an APR is not an effective tool to measure a loan that typically lasts two to four weeks. Second, the interest attached to these loans should be viewed as a service fee. If a plumber comes to my house and fixes one pipe in 30 minutes and then charges me $50, did I pay him $100 an hour or did I pay him a $50 service fee? There's no question consumers should be protected by effective regulations that safeguard their financial well-being. However, regulations that curb choice and stifle, stifle access to credit have no place in our economy. According to CFPB's February 2019 rulemaking on small dollar lending, the majority's hearing memo, 17 states and the District of Columbia have either banned payday loans or have regulations that do not allow payday lenders to sustain their business models. Restricting the availability of short-term credit will not solve the financial problems facing so many American families, but it will push them towards riskier and unregulated products. If the federal government takes a similar approach to these 17 states and small dollar short-term products are regulated out of existence, where will the 12 million, 12 million Americans who utilize small dollar loans go to to get the financial services they need? This is a question that this subcommittee and the witnesses in front of us must focus on today. Thank you, Chairman Meeks, for holding this hearing, and I thank you the panel for appearing with us. I look forward to a robust discussion and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman, I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia for one minute, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, I want to welcome you back home. I understand it was quite a challenging trip. Good to have you back safe and sound. Um, this is an important hearing as we try to grapple with ways in which we can make sure everybody regardless of where they fit in the economic stream, can enjoy and participate meaningfully in our grand economic system. Unfortunately, that is not so true for those who are fall at a certain level within the lower income and middle income of having access. And this is why uh, I have, along with uh, my Republican colleagues, introduced a couple of very important bills, one improving access to the Traditional Banking Act of 2019 and the FinTech Act, um, uh, along with my colleague, uh, Mr. Barry Laudermilk. Look forward to it and uh, getting into this very meaningful hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize the gentleman who is the the, the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Welcome back, Mr. Meeks. Thank you for being here. Thanks for holding this hearing. And thank you, uh, Ranking Member Lukemeyer, for your leadership as well. Uh, research conducted by the Pew Charitable Trust found that 62% of payday loan customers would be forced to delay bill payments if payday loans became unavailable. Uh, there are real lives at stake, and access to credit uh, is, is limited. So. For consumers with less than pristine credit or for those who are credit invisible or underbanked, financial choices 
are severely impaired and limited. Uh, misguided regulation, in fact, misguided law uh, often limits access to credit um, in a way that is not in the best interest of borrowers. We will hear from uh, firsthand today from Robert Cheryl, who's the only uh, person on the committee uh, on, on the witness stand uh, who's actually relied on a payday loan. He has a story to tell and a very powerful story. Moreover, new technologies have emerged to foster greater financial inclusion by helping customers through microloan financing, advanced payment alternatives, and data-driven underwriting. Those are useful and good models. The truth is we need to help people save, and that is a, a, in our national interest. But we also need folks that do fall behind to get short-term lending so they can get back into a stable situation. So with that, uh, Chairman Meeks, thank you for your leadership, and I yield back. Thank you, and I now would like to welcome our witnesses, and I think that we have a great panel. I'm looking forward to hearing from them, and I'm gonna introduce you all first. Uh, first, we have the Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Hayes III, a pastor, a passionate leader, a social activist, a an orator, and an educator engaged in preaching the gospel, fighting against racial injustice, committed to economic justice, empowerment in underserved communities, and touching and transforming the lives of the disenfranchised for over 35 years. Dr. Haynes has served as senior pastor of Friendship West Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. Mr. Kenneth Whitaker is a community and political activist who has spent the last 14 years fighting for racial justice for the 99% of us, quote unquote, to use his words. He currently serves as the Southeast Michigan Organizing Director at Michigan United and Michigan's People's Campaign. Mr. Whitaker has traveled the country training activists, inspiring new leaders, and developing the skills of those building the progressive movement. Mr. Whitaker is a lifelong Detroiter, where he still proudly resides with his wife, his partner in raising six young adults, including five college students and one Navy seaman. Ms. Diane Standard is Executive Vice President and Director of State Policy at the Center for Responsible Lending. Ms. Standard directs CRL's state level policy agenda to advance responsible lending policy and practices across all of CRL's issues. She also oversees CRL's work on issues of small dollar lending, and she's a graduate of the Florida State University and holds a JD degree from the University of North Carolina School of Law. Mr. Todd O. McDonald serves as Vice President and Board Director at Liberty Bank and Trust of New Orleans. He began his career at Liberty Bank and, and Trust 13 years ago. He is intimately involved in the company's high-level corporate strategy decisions that ultimately affect the long-term growth and sustainability of the bank. In addition to his work at Liberty Bank and Trust, Mr. McDonald is active in real estate, technology, and fast food. He's, he received his BS in business management from Morehouse College and a master's in business administration from Northwestern uh, Kellogg, Kellogg, Kellogg School of Management. Next we have Mr. Chris Patterson. Mr. John L. Flynn, endowed professor of law, University of Utah, and S.J. Quincy College of Law, Salt Lake City, Utah, Professor Patterson was on leave from 2012 to 2016, serving as special advisor in the Office of the Director at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the Office of Legal Policy and Personnel for, and Readiness in the United States Department of Defense and as Senior Counsel for the Enforcement Policy and Strategy in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Office of Enforcement. Mr. Patterson is a Consumer uh, Fellow of the American Bar Association's Consumer Financial Services Committee. Mr. Gary Reeder II is Vice President, Policy and Innovation, Center for Financial Services Innovation. Mr. Reeder sets the strategic direction and responsible for execution of CFSI's innovation uh, portfolio and policy activity. He leads the Financial Solutions Lab, a community of startups, financial services companies, and nonprofit organizations building solutions to improve financial health in America. Mr. Reeder's broad experience in regulatory matters stems from his work at the CFPB, the FDIC, the U.S. Treasury, and in the asset management industry. He holds a BA in history from Yale College and an MBA from Columbia Business School. 
Mr. Robert Sherrill, Chief Executive Officer, Imperial Cleaning Systems. A Nashville native, Mr. Sherrill has overcome many challenges. As a young man, Mr. Sherrill served time in the federal penitentiary where he vowed to make a change for his family and himself. Upon his release, he opened Imperial Cleaning Services, a commercial cleaning restoration and janitorial company based in Nashville, Tennessee, where he serves as president and CEO. He has been recognized as one of Nashville's 40 under 40 and the Black Chambers, Chamber of Commerce's rising star. He's also the president of Impact Youth Outreach, a nonprofit organization working to combat youth crime. And lastly, we have Mr. Diego Zuluga. Is that right? Zuluaga. Zuluaga. He is a policy analyst, Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives, and the Cato Institute, where he covers financial technology and consumer credit. Prior to joining Cato, he was the head of financial services and tech policy at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. Originally from Bilbao in northern Spain, he holds a BA in economics and history from McGill University and an MSc in financial economics from the University of Oxford. Thank you, witnesses, for being here. I want to remind you that your oral testimony will be limited to five minutes, and without objection, your written statement will be made an official part of the record in its entirety. And so I now recognize for five minutes uh, the Reverend Dr. Hayes. Thank you, Chairman Meeks, and to the ranking member Luchtemeyer and to all of the distinguished members of this committee. It would be iniquitous and immoral for someone who's been knocked down to receive ha handcuffs when they have, out of desperation, asked for a hand up. The petty loan industry is guilty of such unjust and unethical practices that prey upon the desperation of the poor who are already disadvantaged. Petty predators hijack the hopes of the vulnerable and re-victimize them by baiting them into a debt trap. These hunters of the helpless are guilty of dealing bad hands with bad plans to use the language of Kendrick Lamar. As pastor of Friendship West in Dallas, I have heard too many share their experience of being exploited and ensnared in the payday debt trap. One of my members, a 74-year-old senior citizen who was feisty and fiercely independent, discovered she didn't have the money to pay a bill. She saw a commercial for a payday loan and felt it was an answer to prayer. Now she feels like the devil has answered her prayer. She's on a fixed income, and when the repayment was due, she didn't have enough and had to take out another loan to pay the first one. She ended up with a dozen loans. When she approached me for help one Sunday after church, this once proud senior saint with good credit was ashamed and tearful. She showed me the paperwork. I was appalled. The interest rate was 620%. She was dealt a bad hand with a bad plan. She was hurting for help. She took the bait of the payday loan and became trapped in debt that made her bad situation so much worse. I could call the roll, but I'll proceed. Payday predators are a part of a hostile takeover of the unbanked and underserved. The exploitative industry targets and saturates communities already suffering from economic apartheid. I'm not exaggerating when I say that when the vulnerable are drowning in desperation, the payday industry throws a life preserver weighted with iron of usurious interest rates. The average annual interest rate for payday loans in the United States, 391% APR, is absurd and outrageous. Payday and car title loans use a predatory business model in order to create a long-term cycle of debt at triple digit interest rates. These short term loans were never designed to be paid back in a short period of time. A fact check of the average number of payday loans per borrower in each state tells this sinful story. It's oxymoronic that in the land of the free, debt traps are set for the vulnerable. Of course, the payday predators will put the spotlight on the rare exceptions who have been able to dodge the debt trap. But that should not blind us to the many who are in the shadows of a financial nightmare. 
that never seems to end as their bank accounts are overwhelmed with overdraft fees or close down. Some fall into bankruptcy. Many lose their cars to repossession. It's time for a new plan for those who have been dealt a bad hand. 2017 CFPB rule is a plan that simply requires that before payday and car title lenders make certain loans, they assess whether potential customers can afford to pay them back with the finance charges given the customer's income and other exp expenses. What a novel concept. This is common sense foundation of responsible lending. The rule is a good plan that protects many of our nation's families from the worst impacts of triple digit interest debt traps set by payday and car title lenders. A coalition of citizens committed to protecting consumers have mobilized to push for strong reforms of predatory practices. Included in this coalition of conscience are those personally impacted by debt trap practices, advocates for low-income families, veterans, the elderly, responsible businesses, and faith-based groups. We are appalled that the CFPB would propose ripping out the heart of the rule in favor of allowing payday lenders to continue to exploit those who are struggling and vulnerable. We're calling for strong protection so those who experience an emergency don't end up drowning in debt they cannot repay. We are called to protect families from financial predators and a 36% rate cap would leave no one behind and ensure that they cannot be preyed upon when life happens. Friendship West has a credit union. We offer small dollar loans for those who are vulnerable at an interest rate of 28%, a business model that is just works for all. Please, let's protect the, protect the vulnerable, lest we hear Jesus say, I was hungry, and you gave me a payday loan. I was given a bad hand, and you gave me a bad plan. Thank you. And now recognize and I understand that Mr. Whitaker also had received payday loans in the past. Mr. Whitaker, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Meeks. Uh, Madam Chairman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, Chairman Meeks, thank you. Ranking Member Tipton and members of the committee, it's an honor to be here today. My name is Ken Whitaker and I'm from Detroit, Michigan. As Chairman Meeks said, I am a hardworking husband and a father of six brilliant young adults, five of whom are college students, one of whom is waiting at home for me to return so that he can go to MEPS to leave for the Navy of this great country. Years ago, I was working in IT at the University of Michigan when I withdrew money from my paycheck and proceeded to lose that cash out of my pocket as I pulled out a $20 bill to buy a hot dog for my young son. Unfortunately, I took out a payday loan of $700 to cover that loss. That turned out to be a very big mistake that truly altered the course of my life. I found out that I could not pay off that first loan without reborrowing to make ends meet into the next paycheck. This began a cycle of debt which lasted over a year. Soon I was paying $600 a month in fees and interest. I eventually closed my bank account to limit the payday lender's ability to draw money directly from my account, leaving my family without the cash for rent, for groceries, and other essential bills. This led to debt collection calls and a judgment. My tax return was garnished, making things that much worse for my family. All told, that original $700, $700 loan cost me over $7,000. I spoke out about my experience at the time the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was developing a rule that would require lenders to make loans based on customers' ability to repay and that they could afford. To me, that requirement only makes sense, and that's how all lending should be. Having been through this experience myself, I know how devastating payday lending can be. It's quite disturbing to me that the current leadership of the CFPB is threatening to repeal the rule that we lobbied so hard for to protect us. I strongly support keeping the 2017 CFPB rule. I also support the proposal to cap annual interest rates at 36% to stop predatory lenders from trapping customers into high cost loans that can ruin their financial lives. Since the day I bought that hot dog for my son, we've worked to make things better for working families. Coming full circle, 
my son and his siblings are here today with me in DC as we've been fighting for fairness and justice. Please support strong reform of predatory payday and car title lending for people like me. We work hard to support our families and make finances stable, and this kind of lending only makes it harder. Thank you for allowing me to share my story today, and I urge you to protect working families and put people over profits. Thank you. The gentleman yields back his time. And now, Ms. Uh, Standard, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Ranking Member Meeks, Ranking Member Luke Meyer, and Ranking Member McHenry. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Diane Standard. I'm the Director of State Policy and Executive uh, Vice President for the Center for Responsible Lending. The Center for Responsible Lending is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, and policy and research organization dedicated to building family wealth through the elimination of abusive lending practices. Our organization's nearly 20 years of research on payday and car title loans show consistently two things. One, these loans are a debt trap by design. Two, the harms of these debt trap products further economic inequality and further the racial wealth gap. Payday and car title loans charge 300% annual percentage rates and strip away around $8 billion in fees on loan fees from people typically earning about $25,000 a year. The bulk of these fees are generated by the debt trap. 75% of all payday loan fees are due to borrowers stuck in more than 10 loans a year. The typical car title loan is refinanced eight times. Low-income borrowers then suffer a cascade of financial consequences, delinquency on other bills, having their bank account closed, and even bankruptcy. For car title lenders, an astonishing one in five borrowers have their cars seized. Borrowers have described this debt trap in their own words as soul crushing, a hole you can't get out of, and a living hell. As borrowers suffer these harms, the role of private equity has increased to fuel the engines of this industry. What people see at the street level as a small little lender storefront is actually the tentacles of private equity extracting billions of dollars a year from people already struggling to make ends meet. And research has shown time and time again that payday and car title loan storefronts disproportionately locate in black and Latino communities, even when they have the same or higher income as white neighborhoods. Thankfully, policy trends at the state and federal level for more than a decade have been to rein in the harms of these unsafe loans, ranging from the 2006 passage of the 36% rate cap for the Military Lending Act to protect our active duty military families, to voter affirmed rate caps of 36% in states like South Dakota, Colorado, Arizona, Montana, and others. Today, 16 states plus the District of Columbia enforce caps of 36% or less covering nearly 100 million people with this most effective protection against the harms of these loans. Since 2005, no state has legalized payday lending. Today, I would like to emphasize four important points. Payday and car title lenders have situated themselves intentionally to perpetuate our country's two-tiered financial services system. The harms and consequences of these loans exacerbate the wealth gap and disproportionately burden communities of color. Older Americans and people on fixed income are also particularly vulnerable. To reduce these harms, the predatory nature must be addressed head on. Competition and alternatives will not lower the cost of 300% interest rate loans. Finally, the states, Congress, and federal regulators all have a role to play in ensuring that people are not ensnared in these debt traps. We are thankful for Senator Durbin's leadership in proposing a 36% rate cap that does not override strong state laws. Congress and federal regulators must reject any proposal that in the name of innovation or otherwise preempts stronger state law. Today, on behalf of more than 700 organizations participating in the Stop the Debt Trap campaign, we call on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to implement, not delay, not repeal, its 2017 payday rule, which simply requires lenders to verify that 
borrowers have the ability to repay the loan. This common sense notion of ensuring a loan is affordable is the bedrock of responsible lending. And it is strongly supported by voters all across this country. 75% support among Republicans and Democrats alike. The fact that payday and car title lenders resist such a notion confirms everything we know about the lending business model. In summary, policymakers have a choice. Siding with the vast majority of voters and borrowers who oppose the payday loan debt trap or siding with the predatory lenders who charge 300% annual interest rates. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. McDonald for five minutes. Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member Luca Meyer, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to testify on the small dollar lending industry. My name is Todd McDonald. I'm a senior vice president and board director at Liberty Bank and Trust Company. I'm also a board member of the National Bankers Association, the leading trade association for the, com for the country's minority depository institutions. The NBA's mission is to serve as an advocate for the nation's MDIs on all legislative and regulatory matters concerning affecting our member institutions as well as the communities they serve. Small dollar lending has become a fast growing source of consumer credit in the United States and a key to financial inclusion, particularly for those underserved communities. Unfortunately, existing federal law does not limit the interest rate non-bank lenders can charge on loans of $2,500 to $10,000. This lack of interest rate cap has resulted in a recent explosion of loans with annual interest rates in the range of 100% to 225% and above. While 35 states have imposed caps on non-bank lenders, there is still a significant gap in protections for customers. As a CDFI that serves a largely low and moderate income consumer base that often utilizes these high cost products, Liberty often works to help our customers get out of these predatory loans and into more manageable instruments. This dynamic is one of many reasons why we have created our own small dollar loan product called the Freedom Fast Loan. The Freedom Fast Loan was created in 2008 because we saw a demand for a responsible small dollar product in the markets that we serve. Our customers use for Freedom Fast loans for everything from funeral expenses to consolidation loans for other high interest debt like credit cards and payday loans. The average loan is just over $6,000 and the average interest rate is right at 12.6%. Our APR never exceeds 34.3% and we serve customers with credit ranging from the low 500s over to 700 beacon scores. We also report payments to the credit bureaus so our customers can also build their credit while using our product. In order to scale our Freedom Fast product and for community banks to provide similar options, we believe that there are steps federal banking regulators and Congress must take in order to facilitate the kind of robust marketplace where community banks can compete with predatory small dollar lenders. The Credit Union National Administration's PALS program and the findings from the FDIC's small dollar loan pilot program should provide the basis for regulators to consider a small dollar regulatory regime tailored to community banks like our member institutions. Even our Freedom Fast loans attracted scrutiny in the past from regulators despite it meaning meeting an obvious credit need in the markets we serve. To that end, we believe that a sandbox approach from banking regulators that allows community banks to develop responsible small dollar alternatives tailored to the credit needs of our communities would be a welcome next step in carving out a role for mission-oriented lenders to provide responsible alternatives. In addition to a sandbox for community banks, we would also urge Congress to fully fund the small dollar loan program, authorizing grants for loan loss reserves for CDFIs, seeking to provide responsible small dollar alternatives, technical assistance grants for CDFIs seeking to provide payday alternatives for expenses like underwriting software and other administrative costs that would be definitely encouraged. 
According to the OCC, U.S. consumers borrow nearly $90 billion every year in short-term debt, typically ranging from $300 to $5,000. Due to the cost and the increasing regulations, many banks have withdrawn from this market, resulting in consumers turning to alternative lenders as the last resort. Within the right environment, banks can provide affordable short-term loan options that can help consumers with their financial needs while establishing a path to more mainstream financial products. However, it is very important that policymakers create a regulatory atmosphere where these loans are profitable for banks that take on this customer niche and do not lead to additional regulatory burdens. Policymakers should, always, should also create an environment where community banks can partner with responsible non-bank lenders to fill the obvious need in this lending space. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And Mr. Peterson, I apologize to you. I was reading and I was, you know, and I was just told my staff, I didn't even look up a second. I called you Patterson. That's it's right. Mr. Peterson. You're now recognized for five minutes. Well, well thank you, Chairman Meeks. Uh, also, uh, thank you, Ranking Member Luke Mayor, and also Ranking Member uh, McHenry. It's an honor to be here today. Thank you very much for uh, uh, holding this hearing and also for attending the hearing. Um, uh, I, I'd like to begin with two quick statistics to get started. Uh, first is the average interest rate of the New York City so-called La Cosa Nostra organized crime families in their organized loan sharking syndicates at the height of their power in the 1960s. And that average interest rate was 250%, very high interest rate. But by way of comparison, the average interest rates nationwide in storefront payday loan stores is about 400, I think it's probably about 420% APR. Nearly twice as expensive as the so-called, uh, the interest rates are nearly twice as expensive as the so-called mob charged. And, and you know, all for, throughout the vast majority of American history, for over 200 years, virtually every state in the union did not tolerate interest rates at that at those prices. We had usury limits in all 13 original American uh, uh, colonies. You know, the, all the signatories to the Declaration of Independence, every delegate to the Constitutional Convention, all those guys went straight back to their states where they had interest rate limits of between six to seven or eight percent or thereabouts. It wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century where we start to raise those interest rate limits to about between 18 to 42 percent, and 36 percent was the tried and true interest rate limit all throughout the Great Depression. The greatest generation, the so-called greatest generation that went and fought the Second World War, they all came back to states that had interest rate caps of about 36 percent, even on the smallest, most expensive loans. Uh, without those interest rate caps, the problem is that people fall into debt traps. If there's one thing I could get you to look at, it's the screenshot that I included in my written testimony. The screenshot is from a, a, an auto title lender that made a $1,971 loan to a, a, a woman. Um, I've changed her name for her privacy. She was a client. Um, she borrowed this money because she was behind on her bills. Uh, it had an, an interest rate of 300%. And month after month, she, she worked as a receptionist, made about $11 an hour as a receptionist. Month after month, she kept paying back as much money as she could. She made payments of $400, $500, $480 payments. Overall, she paid back $4,635 on this original $1,900 loan. But because of the simple power of a 300% interest rate, the lender only applied $1.16 to the principal balance of her loan. And then afterwards, the lender still continued to claim that she owed another $2,422.05, even though she had paid back over $4,000. And this is money that she's making, $11 an hour as, her, as a receptionist. She was still deeper in debt than when she originally began that loan. That is not freedom, that is a trap. It's a debt trap. And then I'd also like to say Americans, both Republicans and Democrats, agree that we need to restore our traditional old-fashioned interest rate caps, our usury laws that had protected so many people from all, all across this country throughout the vast majority of our history. 
Uh, that's about three in four, about 73% of Americans in virtually every public opinion poll that's ever been conducted. And in every time there's ever been a ballot initiative on a ballot where the public actually got to vote, they've always voted in favor of usury limits. That means that in every one of your districts, a super majority of your constituents support imposing a traditional interest rate cap, which leaves me with a question of are you going to go along with them with what the public wants, or are you going to vote uh, as legislative legislation comes up in this Congress to protect the payday lenders that charge triple digit interest rate caps and have prices that are higher than the New York City loan sharks charged. And then I'll uh, end on one thing. I would urge you to consider as a template for moving forward, think about looking at the Military Lending Act. You know, the people that defend freedom in this country, the United States military, respected on both sides of the aisle, their people were falling into trouble because of these predatory debt traps, and they put a stop to it. They got over, they lobbied, and they got Congress to pass an interest rate limitation on loans to service members. That limitation is now in effect, and I'm proud to say that I, uh, along with a number of other people, helped work on drafting those regulations, and it's done a great job for our service members. They still have plenty of access to credit. It's time for Congress to learn a little bit about what freedom and free markets mean, uh, means from the people that defend our freedom. Freedom is not the same thing as a debt trap, and in Congress, we need to remember that and restore traditional, old-fashioned, common-sense usury laws to protect our uh, citizens all across this country. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Mr. Rita, you now recognize for five minutes. Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member Luke Meyer, and committee members, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share some thoughts and insights on the small-dollar credit industry and its impact on Americans' financial health. Small dollar credit has been a core part of my work for over a decade and is deeply entwined with my experience growing up in rural North Carolina. Some of my earliest memories involve accompanying my grandmother in her brown 1973 Ford Maverick every payday to pay her lenders. She, like so many other people in my community, had limited access to mainstream financial services. As the son of a Baptist minister, I also saw up close the real world needs of our most vulnerable brothers and sisters. Nearly every week, someone came up after service, seeking help paying rent, buying diapers, or getting gas. Since my family, like many others, lived paycheck to paycheck, our ability to help one another was limited by our own lack of resources. I ask that we keep these people and the millions of Americans like them in mind as we bring our different perspectives to the table in an effort to improve the financial health of all Americans. As we all know, Financial services has the ability to protect us from economic ruin and enable us to build better lives for ourselves, our families, and our communities. However, far too often financial services, particularly credit and our antiquated payment system, make people's lives more difficult. I am the Vice President of Policy and Innovation at the Center for Financial Services Innovation, a leading authority on consumer financial health. We're a trusted resource for business leaders, policymakers, and innovators united in a mission to improve the financial health of their customers, employees, and communities. Our largest initiatives include the Financial Solutions Lab and the U.S. Financial Health Pulse. The Financial Solutions Lab is a seed stage fintech accelerator focused on advancing the financial health of low and moderate income and historically disadvantaged consumers. The U.S. Financial Health Pulse is an annual snapshot of how Americans manage their financial lives with actionable insights to improve financial health. Our research suggests that a variety of different needs and use cases underlie the demand for small dollar credit, and that many of them are symptomatic of one or more dimensions of poor financial health. Payday lenders, auto title lenders, pawn shops, and other subprime lenders have dominated the provision of small dollar credit for much of the last 30 years. Many of the products they have offered are rarely underwritten, rely on cycles of continuous use, and harsh collection practices that both exploit and perpetuate borrowers' financial distress. Auto title loans are particularly concerning because of the potential loss of a car in the event of default. Fortunately, the consumer finance industry is in the midst of a dramatic change as a result of the ever-increasing speed of technological innovation and the broadening and deepening of data availability. FinTech, fintech startups and innovative incumbents are developing and testing products that have the potential to meet the financial needs of underserved households. However, innovation must be tempered with appropriate standards and oversight. In an attempt to address those standards, 
we have developed our own compass principles for small dollar credit. We believe high quality products have seven core characteristics. First, the loan is underwritten. Second, the loan amortizes. Third, lenders make money when the customer succeeds. Fourth, payment history should be reported to the credit bureaus. Fifth, no fine print. Sixth, multiple channels for applications and payment for customers. And seventh, customer, customer service that meets the needs of the customer and not just the lender. In closing, I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to share my thoughts on this important topic and remind all of us that we are here to get this right for consumers rather than to make each other wrong. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Rita. Mr. Sherrill, you're now recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member Luca Meyer, and members of the committee. My name is Robert Sherrill, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak to you about my experience with payday and title loans. I'm not sure if I'm the only person on this panel who has actually used these products, but I hope that with my testimony, I can shed some light on how important they were for me at the time when I had no other options. Payday and title loans helped me when I had nowhere else to turn. I might not be here if these forms of credit were not available to me. In your invitation letter to me, you asked me to discuss research describing the various harms consumers may suffer when utilizing these products. I cannot talk about research, but I can talk about my personal experience. When I took out my payday loan, I knew what it would cost me. While I have not taken out a payday loan recently, I still know what they cost. Given my circumstances at the time and the lack of other options, I determined that this basic small loan was the best option for me. In fact, it was a cheaper and easier solution than the available alternatives. I am lucky that there was a lender available that would make the loan someone to, that would loan someone like me in my circumstances. But let me get back to the beginning of my story. When I was young, nobody taught me about money and finances, which is a situation not uncommon to many people. Because of family issues and hard times, I ended up raising myself and getting involved in selling drugs, which ultimately led, led to me going to prison. I'm not proud of this, but it's, not it's an important part of my experience. When I got out of prison, the deck was stacked against me. I was a felon with no credit, no education, and very little income. I'd ask you to put yourself in a lender's shoes. Would you have made a loan to me? Would you have offered me a lifeline? Would you have given me credit with nothing to prove I was credit worthy by my word? Due to my release and probation requirements, I found a job as a food busser at a local Italian restaurant. I worked very hard day to, day to day to make ends meet. After a year, I was given a 10 cent raise. It was then I knew I had to make a change in my life. When I started my business, no one would give me a loan. I knew this because I applied and I was rejected several times. Most banks wouldn't even let me open an account. The only account I could get was with the credit union because I played, I played my case. The ordinary people are uneducated or too unsophisticated to make smart financial decisions. In my situation, I was tracking every dollar I had. I knew when money was coming in and I knew when it was going out. I knew that I would have to repay the loans that I took out. When I went to Advanced Financial, every part of the process was explained clearly and fairly, including when payments were due, how much they would be, and how much it would cost me for the loan. Today, the business that I started with, a payday loan, is Nashville's premier construction and commercial cleaning service. I'm a minority certified business belonging to the Chamber of Commerce and the Better Business Bureau and the Nashville's Rotary Club. Now I qualify for lines of credit and other types of loans. I have developed a solid business foundation but it, but it is all because of the lifeline that Advanced Financial gave me when no one would give me the time of day. I have also come to learn from being in business that sometimes a market determines what things cost. Many today will probably ask if I like these types of loans to be cheaper, but there are a lot of things in life that I would wish that were cheaper. But forcing these lenders out of business will not make loans cheaper. It would only have people in the situation like I was I want to repeat what I said at the beginning of this statement. I understand what a payday loan is going to cost me when I took it out, and I understand when I had to pay it back. The best consumer protection that I got was to have someone to go, somewhere, someplace to go that was willing to make a loan to me and to explain the loan I got. I can also tell you that if I had not had
You hitting the button? Yeah. Yeah. Mike must have gone out. Perhaps you could yield him some more time and then I will uh, use someone else's microphone. Yep. You had 28 seconds. I'm out. Oh, 30 seconds is good. Give him 30 seconds to wrap up. If you eliminate, eliminate these loans and these lenders, what do you expect people to turn for a lifeline? I had tried everything else. For many people like me, these products are a first step toward getting things back together. People choose them because they are better than the alternatives. If they weren't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't exist. We should trust people to choose what is best for their own situations, not take options away from them, because the most expensive credit is the credit you cannot get when you need it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Zuluanga, you're up for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member Lutkemeyer, and members of the subcommittee uh, for the opportunity to testify before you this afternoon. My name is Diego Zuluaga, and I'm a policy analyst at the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. Creating the conditions for a dynamic and competitive market for short-term credit is essential to promoting financial security and financial inclusion. At a time when 24% of American families and 50% of low-income families lack enough liquid savings to cover a $400 emergency expense, broad and immediate access to credit is a matter of great urgency. Furthermore, with 8.4 million households unbanked and another 24 million underbanked, a share of that emergency credit is bound to come from non-banks, including payday and vehicle title lenders. Payday loans are often one of very few options available to cash-strapped households. 16% of payday borrowers use these loans to cover emergencies, while 69% borrow to pay for recurring items, such as rent and utility bills. Payday loans offer a way to cope with unexpected events and month-to-month -month income volatility, which is a reality for more than a third of low-income households. While the media often describe payday loans as predatory, the evidence suggests otherwise. Professor Ronald Mann of Columbia Law School in a study quoted extensively by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, finds that 60% of payday borrowers accurately estimate the time it will take them to repay the loan. And importantly, there is no systematic bias in their predictions of repayment, so borrowers overestimate roughly as much as they underestimate the time it will take them to repay. Professor Mann's results contradict the assertion that payday borrowers are misled by predatory lenders, or that they suffer from some behavioral bias. The academic literature, in fact, on payday lending finds that these loans are helpful to borrowers and that payday loan bans are harmful, at least as often as it finds the opposite. Payday borrowers make the best of limited options. As Professor Lisa Servan of the University of Pennsylvania writes, quote, the question is whether expensive credit is better than no credit at all. Like Professor Servan, I worry that placing an interest cap on short-term credit would altogether remove access to emergency funds for the most vulnerable Americans. Now, I've had the opportunity to study in detail the impact of payday loan interest rate caps in the United Kingdom. While UK regulators expected loan volume to decline by just 11% after the introduction of an interest cap, it dropped by 56%. That's five times what regulators estimated within 18 months. The number of borrowers dropped by 53% versus 21%, which was the estimate. Now, given that regulators' forecasts aimed for the, quote, optimal amount of payday borrowing, this miscalibration of the cap's impact almost surely left hundreds of thousands of payday borrowers worse off. I worry that the Bureau's payday rule, which predicts loan volume to drop by up to 68%, but expects most borrowers to retain access to payday facilities, will actually prove similarly over-optimistic. And the consequences of regulatory error could be very damaging, as the UK case demonstrates. Low usury caps were once widespread across American credit markets. But progressive reformers in the early 1900s recognized that caps harmed low-income people by throwing them into the hands of loan sharks. Gradually, they persuaded legislators to lift or remove interest caps, helping the formal market for short-term credit to flourish. Placing a cap on small-dollar loans today risks leaving vulnerable households at the mercy of either family members or unscrupulous providers, or otherwise forcing them to go without basic necessities. Policymakers can, however, do more to promote financial inclusion, and I welcome efforts to bring a greater focus on underserved households to financial regulators. For example, I think the CFPB and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation should conduct a joint review of the regulatory costs to banks of maintaining deposit accounts. 
This will permit them to compare the cost of regulation with its benefits and to determine whether financial regulation excludes low-income and minority borrowers, who are overwhelmingly represented among the ranks of the unbanked. But I wouldn't limit this work to fostering access to depository institutions, important as such access is. Financial innovations like mobile money accounts have delivered impressive results around the world. And with 94% of Americans now owning a cell phone, mobile accounts could bring essential financial services to households which, for reasons related to cost or trust or both, do not own a bank account. Mobile payments could therefore help low-income cons consumers avoid account fees and gradually gain access to other financial services and build a credit record. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And I now recognize myself for five minutes to ask questions. Let me first recognize, I listened very intently to everyone on this panel, and I did not hear one person say that those who are in uh, low income areas, et cetera, should not have access to some financial services, not one. What I did hear is some say that we do have, basically, they didn't use these words, but we have some who will con people. We've got some who will just come and try to confuse people for their own benefit, for their own basis. And so they don't mind whether or not someone gets trapped in a loan that they can't get out because that's not their interest, not that individual. Their interest is to make as much money that they can at the expense of someone else. And so when we had Dodd-Frank, what we did was we said we were going to create the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau so that somebody can review this. Because we know we got good people and we got bad people. So that somebody could review it and make an impartial, if you will, determination to make sure that you could continue to do business if that's what you wanted to do, but to also serve someone who needed a loan. Now, one of the things that, and one of the reasons why we're here, is that immediately the CFPB, after the change of administrations, got rid of the unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices and how that was defined. So if you get rid of that, you've got a fixed game. Because you've got a, sit a situation where on one side, and yes, Mr. Sherrill, I agree with you, some know how to manage their money, some don't. That's a fact. And as a matter of public policy, we've got to look out and protect those that don't. I would also say, my question would go to Mr. McDonald, because one of the basic tests would be ability to pay. If somebody comes, and I would, and I'll ask you this question later, Mr. Sherrill, and they have no ability to pay, say, I have no idea how I'm going to pay you back. No, nobody's going to give you any money. Not if they are serious. But you've got to have a show some ability to pay it back. That's how we got in the financial crisis, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression in 2008 when people were giving no doc loans. And it almost brought our financial institutions and our financial services and this country to its knees. Mr. McDonald, you work in these communities and you have a financial uh, uh, institution. What is the best way you would think uh, to make sure that someone has the ability to pay when you lend out a loan at your facility? So we follow a couple of different guidelines, but we definitely ask for verification of income uh, via a copy of their pay stub or W-2 or 1099. So you do check to make sure that they have some ability to have a job or some kind of way to pay? Absolutely. Right. Now, Mr. Rita, in my limited time, because I listened, your, your testimony was so riveting, I had to take up my time early with that comment. But I want to make sure, I, you know, I, got this, I, have, I wear this suit now, but I come from public housing. My parents were poor, okay? And I can remember that they had loan sharks back then, and so it wasn't money, they'd take your limb too. But I also could know when they were getting ripped off. I'm looking at ways to make sure that we have uh, 
some, some ability for financial services in the communities. FinTechs have been talked about, but FinTechs unregulated has the same problems. Can you give us some ideas on how FinTechs would be, uh, should be regulated or how it could be helpful in this industry? Sure, uh, thank you, Chairman. In terms of regulation, obviously a number of financial institutions are regulated at the state level, but it is true as for purposes of Dodd-Frank that many institutions in the, what people broadly call FinTech are not covered persons under Dodd-Frank for the CFPB. So one piece there is that the CFPB would need to write a larger participant rule uh, for a number of these institutions in order to supervise them. And for many people uh, who have been regulators, supervision is a very powerful tool to both understand what the institutions are doing, but more importantly, what are the outcomes for the consumer. So I think that is a, a, that is a capability that the federal government has today if the CFPB were to write a large participant rule. Thank you, I'm out of time, and I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Luca Meyer, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I think most of the testimony today centered around the, the, the cap, uh, the APR, of 36% are higher rates that we're talking about. And it's, you know, to me, it's, it's a little difficult to accept the arguments from the standpoint that when you're looking at a short-term loan, to me, that's very similar to a service charge. You know, in my testimony, in my, my opening comment, I said, look, if you got a plumbing problem at your house, you call the plumber, and he comes and he fixes it within 30 minutes and charge you 50 bucks. Do he charge you 50 bucks or he charge you 100 bucks an hour? To me, he charged me 50 bucks because it took him that long to get there. He had to pay for his tools, pay for his insurance, had to pay for his workman's comp, he had to pay for his gas and oil to get there. It's a service charge to provide that product. And so I think today when we use, on short-term lending, when we use APR, it's a disservice to everybody. To me personally, I don't think you need to be using a, an APR unless it's an annual, unless you're over 12 months. It's a 12-month loan or more, then you use an APR. Anything less than that, it's got to be a service charge because how do you, what's the cost to put the loan on the books? Uh, Mr. Donald, I mean, you talked, you're in the banking business. What's it, what does it cost you to put a loan on the books? A small dollar loan. Does it cost 15 bucks? Is that, is it got, is that going to cover it? I don't have that exact number. Uh, however, it does cost money to market to those individuals and also use our back office to book those loans, yes. Yeah. So it, there, there, there's a cost there that has to be covered, otherwise it's not gonna be, that, 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 that service is not gonna be provided. Uh, and then, so you get into the situation where all, we don't have any services or the loans are mis, misused or abused. You know, the CFPB in the fall of uh, 2018, their own numbers show that seven-tenths of 1% were the complaints received by CFPB on, 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 on small dollar loans, on payday loans, which is consistently one of the lowest of the various financial products according to CFPB. When I was in the house in Missouri, a state rep, my, my committee oversaw, I was a chairman of the Financial Services Committee, and my, what I always did every year was go look at the complaints with regards to the banks, payday lending, and all the other different services that were, that were seen by the Division of Finance. Payday lending was always the lowest number of complaints of any of the financial groups. So I, I think we're, we're looking at something here that is a worthwhile service, Mr. Sherrill, you tell a compelling story. What, what happens, where would you have gone if you wouldn't have the opportunity to have that, that loan? What, were your, what was your next step if you didn't get the loan? I mean, coming from where I come from, my next step was going back to the streets. The only thing that stands between the streets and the pawn shop is payday lending. That's it, that's all we got. So you gotta do what you gotta do. So what we need to do in your mind would be to help folks have more access to credit. If we need to tweak the laws, need to improve it, that would be the way to go rather than try and dismiss it. What, and, and, and you talked about the APR as well. I mean, you, you have some compelling testimony. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the payday loan I got was just for a couple weeks. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't for a year. I've never known anyone to um, receive a payday loan for a year, so I'd be confused when people say APR. I kind of think about a buying a car or something like that, but. So whenever they, if you, I know when I was in the House of Missouri, we read the payday, we redid the payday lending laws. And our, actually, we were actually model legislation for the whole country for a long time. Mm -hmm. And things that we did was put a, a, a box on the form that showed what the cost, actual cost of the loan is going to be, how much you're actually gonna pay in interest and charges. So there was a disclosure 
to me, is that helpful to you to actually see the cost? You said you looked at it. You knew what it was going to cost you. Yeah, I mean, when, you, when I went in there, they explained to me, this is what we're giving you. This is what we expect back at this time. You know, if you don't pay it back, then this is this what happens. I mean, Mr. then you sign. I mean, you signed the states that you understand before they give you any money. Mr. Reeder, in your testimony, you note that an annualized percentage rate is a, is a very poor tool for the uh, small dollar lending market. Would you like to explain that a little bit? Sure. Um, APR was really created to compare like financial products to one another. So it's a shopping tool. If I were to get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage from Bank A and a 30-year fixed rate mortgage from Bank B, I would be able to take the APR and compare to understand what were the interest rates and the charges. So that is uh, what it was designed for. The problem becomes, as the, as the term gets shorter and shorter, the, the APR becomes geometric, so it increases rapidly. Okay, well, I got one quick question. Mr. Zulaga, you talk about the UK and how they uh, estimated that the loan volume would decline slightly and it went over 56%. Uh, where do those people go who no longer have access to credit? Mostly to family members from the research that's been done afterwards, but those are the people who have access to uh, alternative options. A lot of people just go without. They go without? What about some of the uh, unscrupulous folks on the streets or, or, or on offline lending, with, which is unregulated? Is that possible as well? Uh, could be possible. Very hard to monitor, of course, and that's one of the challenges. At least now we can monitor a lot of these lenders, and, you know, they're out in the open. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the chairwoman of the full committee, okay. uh, the Honorable Maxine Waters, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Haynes, as senior pastor at Friendship West Baptist Church, you moderated a panel I convened of interfaith leaders to address predatory lending in American communities. In working with members of your community in Dallas, Texas, many of whom are being targeted by predatory payday loan and auto title loan stores, you stated, and I quote, we want access to credit, but it must be quality credit. Anything less adds to the stress of the desperate and the needy. Well-crafted and compassionate legislation can weed out the predators and enable more responsible and reputable lenders to thrive while rendering a helpful service to, to communities in need, quote, unquote. Can you tell us about the terrible consequences of falling into payday debt traps and your efforts as a faith leader to help these vulnerable consumers? Thank you, Madam, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, First and foremost, of course, when you fall into the debt trap, one of the things that accelerates the downward spiral are the overdraft uh, fees, not to mention the fact that I've had a number of persons come to me along with their overdraft fees. Some have just basically had their bank accounts wiped out. Uh, they were pressured. Uh, they were called on the job, not to mention uh, family members were harassed. And so this is something that is predatory. And so what we are calling for is, is a system. And, and one of the things I've heard repeatedly uh, from the opposition is that, you know, we have some who do well because they had no other option. And so my, my, my point is you always have some who are good enough to beat the system. But if the system is broken, you want to correct the system. Tupac Shakur talked about a rose out of concrete. Well, if one rose can burst through the concrete, we salute that rose. But what about the rest of the seeds who don't make it? And that's why we're concerned about a predatory industry that continues to uh, harass individuals into deeper and deeper debt. And so, again, they're asking for a life preserver, and they end up with a one made of iron that causes them to sink further and further in debt. Wow. Well, uh, uh, Pastor, let me ask you this. As we have wrestled with this very, very troubling uh, problem uh, in this country, and as we have fought off, uh, you know, the payday lending industry, et cetera, we've had people come to us with different ideas and different proposals. One of them that seems to be emerging is, what about limiting payday lending interest rates to 36% the way they do for veterans? Right. Have you had a chance to think about that? Oh, without, without question. Not only that, but even our church, we have a credit union, a, feder a federal credit union, and we offer micro loans, small dollar loans, and our interest rate is 28%. 
it's a great business model because it's moral and just. 36% is a moral and just interest rate. It's a model that will work as opposed to prey on individuals. It's a model that will help them to do what the payday industry claims they want to do, and that is to get out of debt, get out of the debt trap, and at the same time, move forward in their lives. And so 36%, I think, is not only moral, it's just, and it's doable. Wow, well, uh, I thank you for uh, sharing that with us because some of us who were not thinking about anything but trying to stop, you know, uh, the payday industry, payday loan industry, because of all of the trauma and the pain that was, you know, experienced by people who were desperate, who needed some help, and would go to them, but yet get caught in that debt trap that you talked about. We had not thought a lot about uh, doing what we do for the veterans. Yeah. And uh, when I began to think about that, I thought I wanted you here uh, to ask what you thought about it, to get your opinion because of the work that you have put into it, the work that your community has done, the work that the church has done. And I know that you've had to run some out of, uh, uh, out of Dallas, basically, who were exploiting and uh, so now we have uh, these proposals, and you have given me uh, something to de think deeper about, because what you're doing in your church with your loans at 28%, and it's working, uh, and what we're doing with the veterans at 36%, it means that perhaps we can do the same with the entire industry. So I want to thank you for coming on. I know on short notice, but you're, you're so appreciated, and I certainly appreciate you, and thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time, and thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tempton. He's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank the panel for taking the time to be here. And, uh, Obviously, I think uh, all of us want to make sure that people are treated fairly, uh, but we also have regulations, ability to repay, uh, that need to be able to be addressed. And uh, I don't want to put anybody on, on the spot here, but Mr. McDonald, uh, you listened to Mr. Shrell's uh, testimony. Would you have made him a loan coming out of prison? That depends on, on several factors, and obviously uh, when we look at credit, History. We look at repayment capacity. Um, a Coming number out of, of prison things. with no job, probably couldn't have made the loan at that time. I, I believe he said that he had a job, um, and we we certainly have lent money to individuals um, that come from unfortunate backgrounds that may not have a long history of income. But we have certainly made loans. Uh, just a little interested in your model. You're, you're a CDFI, yes. right? And. Uh, can you make, do you make a $100 loan? No, our minimum is 500. Uh, so a minimum, so uh, Mr. Shrell needs $100, $200 uh, to be able to fix his car. You won't cover that loan? No, sir, not okay. at this time. Where, where do they go? They would go to a payday lender. Is, is that their option? In some cases. In, probably in most cases. And, and like I say, I, please understand, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. It's just we do have regulations in place, and it's part of the uh, really purpose of the committee in terms of uh, what we're doing in terms of accountability on the banks and the institutions. And uh, when you're talking about the, the interest rate that you do charge on the, the Freedom Fast loan, how does that compare to somebody with a uh, 800 uh, credit score? So it, it's a it's a tiered scale based right. on. What uh, would you charge for that same loan? Six hundred dollars for somebody that has an eight hundred credit score. Unfortunately, I, I don't have our rate matrix memorized. Probably be a lot less though, wouldn't it? Uh, so just in general, our short-term loan products will cap at nineteen nine on the interest rate side, but I'm not really sure how that'll calculate out into the APR. But as the example that I used earlier. Uh, we have an APR, an average APR of 34.6 percent, I believe. Okay. Well, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, is that this is obviously a challenge for uh, people with low income uh, to be able to deal with. Mr. Shrell, you've you've lived that life, uh, but it is going to be some actual access uh, to some capital at the times when people need it. 
uh, to be able to address that. You know, in my home state of Colorado, we've went through several iterations. Uh, uh, just here in November of 2018, uh, we passed by referendum a new law that's going to be capping that at 36% uh, effectively, uh, and that was the balance that was struck uh, to be able to address that uh, in terms of a challenge for short-term credit products that we have. Uh, Mr. Sherrill, maybe you could uh, maybe address this a little bit more in terms of the availability of payday lending. Um, where do people go in the case of if they only need that two, three hundred dollars uh, to be able to get get a loan? If payday payday lending, as an example, doesn't exist, what do they do? Go on back to the streets or go ask a family member. But you know, we come from I come from a low income family. My my family don't have no money. So, I mean. If it wasn't for me getting a payday loan, I would have went back to the streets. I mean, that's just realistic. I mean, it sounds good for testimony for people to get up here and say what, what's being said right now. But in reality, where I'm from, it's many people. It's not, I'm not the only one with this story. It's many people to use these services and use them responsibly. And we need to spotlight that. And then you would understand because there's no other options. Well, uh, Ms. Shrell, you know, in 2013, the Fed, the OCC, the FDIC issued guidance that caused most banks to stop making or providing products to their customers in terms of short-term, small-dollar loans. Um, these are institutions that are well-regulated uh, and have to make sure that you've got that ability to replace Mr. McDonald was talking about. Uh, what is a good solution to be able to fill that gap for the small-term loans? Uh, should we extend that to more banks uh, or just... I, I really don't know what the answer, <laughs> the magic bullet should be, but I know taking this option away from low income people or people who don't have access to credit or who have, uh, don't have a history of credit will be doing a disservice to the community. Mr. Segala? Uh, just quickly, um, I think banks are now very concerned about coming back into this because of that guidance and unless there's very strong and clear signals that these products are going to be tolerated and accepted and not prosecuted, I think we'll run out of options if we don't uh, continue to allow payday loans. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have 56 million unbanked and underbanked consumers in this country. So many of them are victims, as has been pointed out, uh, I think the good Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass, love that name, and Frederick Douglass, as you may know. And your comments were right on target. All of your comments are. Um, I, I'm, I've introduced two major pieces of legislation that I want to kind of get your reaction on and trying to address with that. The first one is the Improving Access to Traditional Banking Act of 2019, and what this act would do, uh, it would create an office that is specifically tasked with examining factors contributing to households that are unbanked and underbanked, identifying them, their status, and developing the best business practices for improving that situation. Mr. Sherry, you're, all, you're right. Where else do they have to go? Um, but to some of these people, if we don't provide a way and get that information to them. Another bill that I've got is the FinTech Act. And as you know, and I wanna get uh, comments on you, um, some of these FinTech companies are dealing with this area because they are developing partnerships with some of the traditional banks that will not even deal with uh, some of the unbanked and underbanked. So what I'm saying is there are things out there that we're trying to work with to get that. So let me just ask you, um, uh, Mr. McDonald, you are the National Bankers Association uh, tell me about this. What, what about the, uh, the impact of these fintechs helping some of these people who the traditional banks want help? Are you aware of some of those uh, partnerships there? Uh, yes, I am. And um, as an organization, we actually uh, do encourage partnerships with fintechs, uh, obviously to a certain extent. 
but coupled with the technology uh, and the know-how of a traditional bank, it could actually bring down the cost and make the cost more efficient in a product and yeah. service more efficient and effective. And so that's how we've been leveraging our experience. Very good. Now, Mr. McDonald, let me ask you about um, from the banker's standpoint. Um, can you tell us the importance of financial inclusion in the traditional banking sector, and in particular, how the increased safety and affordability and convenience of financial services can have a positive impact on low and moderate income consumers. Um, how can this bill, uh, what we're trying to do with this bill, is, is to try to identify the problem, bring it together, and then apply the necessary resources and coordination to really get to the heart of the matter and make these uh, and try to put an end, or at least slow down, these predatory lenders. They have nowhere else to go. If they don't have a checking account, they don't have a banking account. We got to create this out. Uh, does, does that make sense to you, um, yes, Mr. McDonald? Yes, absolutely, and the National Bankers Association uh, will be open doors and, and definitely willing to speak further in terms of ideas and strategies around solving that problem. It's not an easy problem, mm -hmm. obviously, but we definitely welcome ideas and strategies. All right, now, Mr. Reeder, you're the president of the innovation, I think, what is that, the technological innovation? and The Center for Financial Services Innovation? Yes. Yes. There you go. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to use these innovators, these new, the fintechs, um, uh, other areas to try to create some answers and solutions to this. Are, are we making some progress what the FinTechs partnerships are doing, what our bill would be doing in terms of trying to find ways that we can increase the access of, uh, of uh, capital to these people, lending to them? Chairman, should I answer? I know the time has expired. Yeah, do you give him 10 minutes? Thank you. I'm gonna let him finish, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I've got my own judgment there. Yes, uh, well, I, I think there's enormous opportunity. Um, you know, we work with companies that do things such as allowing people access to wages that they've already earned. We live in a country where people work and they're not paid for their work for some period of time, sometimes two weeks, sometimes a month. So we work with people to allow people access to assets that they already have. There's obviously a lot of work to help understand who's credit worthy. Um, because of a long history of discrimination in this country, credit scores and other traditional means have biases that are embedded in them that are very difficult uh, to undo, and so there are opportunities for us to do that. So in my testimony, I, I right. list a number of companies, and I'm happy Thank to you. Have more time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, time is expired. for the time. Appreciate it. I recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Zuluaga, a uh, question for you. Uh, many small banks and credit unions uh, in, in my congressional district in, in central Kentucky have told me that overzealous supervision, overregulation, and higher compliance costs stemming from the Dodd-Frank Act and other regulations have forced those lenders out of the small dollar lending uh, business, uh, out of the consumer lending space altogether. This has had the impact of pushing many borrowers to payday lenders and other, uh, other forms of non-bank and non-credit union lenders. Is the answer for unbanked credit challenged borrowers more regulation and banning higher cost products? Or is the answer more competition and choice through financial deregulation? And as you answer that question, keep in mind uh, the testimony from Mrs. Standard who said that competition is not the answer. Thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, I think the answer is clearly more competition and more choice because that drives prices down for consumers. It creates options that are more well adjusted to exactly what it is that they need and want. And it also encourages continued innovation so that whatever negative features are in a financial product are no longer present there. Uh, in the particular case of small dollar lending, it was mentioned before that there was a 2013 guidance from the OCC and FDIC that led banks to retreat entirely from the small dollar lending market, and this is in keeping with a general retreat of 
banks, as you suggested, since passage of the Dodd-Frank Act. So you're telling me that banks and credit unions have retreated from this space after Dodd-Frank? But the evidence that I've seen for banks decidedly so for credit unions, I'll have to get back to you because they do some different types. They offer some type of alternative products, but obviously they don't reach everybody. I can tell you that credit unions and small community banks have told me that they have exited consumer lending post Dodd-Frank and because of an avalanche of regulations. Uh, but let me explore this idea of, a, of an APR rate cap. In, in 2018, a, a major super regional bank in the United States began offering small dollar short term loans. The program uh, has a limited scope to those customers with a current banking account. And even with the pricing advantages of lower capital costs and additional risk mitigation employed by that bank, in order for the program to be sustainable, uh, the bank is charging interest rates between about 71% and 88% APR, more than double the 36% APR rate cap that has been advocated by some. If a large super regional institution uh, with all of its market advantages and economies of scale can't make a 36% APR work, why is it realistic to think that a state licensed or non-bank lender c could do that? I don't think it's realistic, Congressman, and in fact, uh, I think we need to think about the small dollar lending space as something of a spectrum. There are products for prime borrowers that carry low rates because they have a credit history and they have a record of paying back their debts. Some people, for various different reasons, don't have necessarily access to such low rates, and removing the options that they have, the people that will accept them as borrowers, doesn't make them better off. It, it makes it, it makes it difficult for them to build a credit record, makes it difficult for them to survive emergencies and so on. Re Reverend Dr. Haynes, uh, thank you for your advocacy and, and, and work to empower people who are tr credit challenged and, um, and, and are struggling financially. Um, let me ask you this, in the course of your advocacy, have you ever engaged those populations that you minister to, that you serve uh, in, in financial literacy specifically on payday loans to say educate those uh, vulnerable populations about the difference between the interest rate if the product is used as it's designed, meaning that it's paid off in two weeks or four weeks, as opposed to rolling it over in order to avoid that triple digit uh, um, uh, APR, which it's never designed to be. Well, yes, we have, uh, to answer your question, we do have not only financial literacy classes for those who find themselves uh, in that predicament, uh, but we also, again, offer the small dollar 28% uh, loan, micro loan, for those persons who are struggling. And a part of uh, their getting the loan is going through the class. And, and Mr. McDonald, um, I appreciate your sandbox approach, and I also appreciate your your advocacy for clarifying true lender to, to create liquidity in the secondary market with FinTech. Let me ask you this, without the small dollar loan program, without technical assistance grants, could you offer small dollar loans or is taxpayer assistance uh, essential in order to originate and service small dollar loans with interest rates below 36%? Uh, I would not say it's essential. This is a, a specific business model that we've chosen as an organization a lot of organizations within the MBA have chosen uh, to do so as well. So our profits are not uh, at peer, peer group levels. We've and, sort of... Yeah, and I'm sorry, my time has expired, but what I worry about is that without taxpayer assistance, Mr. Sherrill doesn't have an alternative, and he's testified to that today. And so the only model that works is having the government compete uh, and compete with uh, private businesses and put them out of business. And you know, there's, there's a limit to the amount that taxpayers can, can, can provide. And so we do need private capital to provide access to credit for some folks. And I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now evened it up. I gave Mr. Scott 40 seconds extra. I've given Mr. Boss. And I'll go back to my five minute rule. And the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Meeks, and I welcome this opportunity to examine the practices of this industry, uh, which it seems more often than not, instead of offering a life raft, has offered um, dead weight, uh, wreaking financial havoc uh, in any community that it touches. I am, however, thankful uh, for the protections of my home state of Massachusetts, um, which has guarded against these debt traps. Payday loans are not allowed in my state and my constituents um, anywhere not exactly clamoring for a 400% interest loan. 
Uh, in fact, according to a Center for Responsible Lending report, consumers in Massachusetts saved more than $248 million in 2017 as a result of these protections. Uh, Ms. Standard, can you tell me, based on your organization's research, how big of a role the state's rate cap has uh, in, creating these sa in creating these savings? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Representative Presley, for the question. Um, a rate cap such as what Massachusetts has in place is the most effective protection against the debt trap. It is due to the rate cap that has garnered the millions of dollars of savings for your own um, residents, and it's the same rate cap that is saving over $5 billion a year to residents across the country in similar states. And so where consumers do not have these protections, payday and small dollar lenders have preyed on the desperation of the working poor, turning their need for a dollar today into a profit of $2 tomorrow. But as we examine this industry, I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge its disparate uh, impact on communities of color. Um, so open to anyone on the panel who would care to comment very briefly, um, just to better understand the, the common threads of these entrenched uh, inequities. Um, what is the profile of a typical payday loan borrower? Thank you, Representative Presley. Um, the typical profile, I think if you look on this panel, you can see uh, the extremes of the profile. Uh, Mr. Sherrill spoke about not having access to credit and not having an opportunity to seek help in his situation. But when you provide a tool, a debt tool like this that's marketed as easy, accessible, and safe, people begin to stop looking for other options. There are many other options. You, people say that, uh, well, Mr. Sherrill said that he didn't uh, have family that could help him or it wasn't that they're low income, there were no income. Well, there's family, there's friends, there's the sweat of your brow. If you need to go buy some clothes and sell them on eBay, there's many other options that are available. But when you put the easy solution in front of somebody and you say that this is safe, why continue to look for harder options? Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. And picking up on that, since you said the magic word, marketing, I'm curious about the marketing of these debt traps since uh, the prevalence of them uh, is in low income and communities of color. So Ms. Standard, can you elaborate on where payday lenders are located and how they compete for uh, businesses in these communities? Yeah, thank you. Uh, payday lenders explicitly state that they um, compete on factors such as location, convenience of servers, convenience of service, and other things. Notably missing from the list is competition based on price. Um, everywhere that payday lenders operate, they uh, charge the maximum rate allowed by law, uh, so 300, 400% interest rates, despite a bunch of them being clustered together. Um, then we also see that payday lenders disproportionately concentrate in communities of color. In California, for example, we see payday lenders locating at over two times the rate in black and Latino communities than other similarly situated white communities. And this pattern exists all throughout the country. Michigan, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, Colorado, all been documented. And so this combination of the importance of payday lending locations in their ability to get customers Thank in the you. door. Re reclaiming my time. Thank you. Um, and then picking up on uh, the Reverend's point about people, instead of getting uh, a hand up, getting handcuffed, um, Mr. Peterson, I know you've done quite a bit of work on the industry's reliance on small claims court, particularly in states like Utah, that do not have interest rates or protections. Um, so what happens when people can't repay? Are there criminal charges? What happens? Well, uh, I have a study coming out. It's not out yet, but uh, we've been looking at um, uh, collection efforts in small claims court, and we've been surprised to find that there are, are a lot of small claims borrowers that end up um, getting bench warrants issued for their arrest. Thank you. Uh, Re reclaiming my time. Uh, this is what's clear. Any universe with payday lending is, is one answering the question of how to make poverty a sustainable, profitable enterprise. So a lot of people are getting rich off of keeping people poor. And so how do we reform anything that's based on that premise? Uh, the short answer is we, we don't. Thank you. I'll yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the, the panel. There's quite a few of you up here, but uh, I, I do appreciate this. This is a very uh, sensitive issue. Ms. Cheryl, I gotta say, 
I'm inspired. Your story is incredible. Uh, I think you, you saw that uh, your story doesn't exactly fit in the narrative that some would like to, uh, to paint, but um, I'm, I'm partially inspired not just by you seeing the opportunity that this nation can give you, you finding a way around the obstacles and the hurdles. That's, that's what makes this country great. The other aspect of it is I've been where you were. Uh, I've been in situations where uh, early in my life after I left the military, I'm trying to, to get a small business started. And Mr. Whitaker, I can't find any place just to buy groceries for my family. I mean, it's, it's, it, I just needed it for a short time. I knew the next check was coming from a job I did, but I didn't have anything to fill the gap. So sometimes people just don't know where it's coming from. And I'm not defending the industry. But I, I'm, I'm saying any business exists where is, there is a need to fulfill. And, and often, we create the problem ourselves being government by over-regulating areas to where we can't fulfill some of those needs. And that's one of the concerns I have. And, and the chairman, in his opening remarks, brought up the statistic that 40% of U.S. adults could not cover a $400 emergency without selling property. And I agree with Mr. Whitaker. Maybe that's what you need to be doing to, to cover an emergency if you have property. The problem I ran into in my situation, I had just moved cross country and I'd sold most everything I had to relocate at this new location. So we sometimes try to paint with a broad brush something that is, is each individual person has a unique situation. And a lot of times these businesses exist to actually fulfill that need. Yes, they're charging a large amount, sometimes too much amount in interest, but yet who they're loaning to are folks that couldn't get the loan anywhere else. But on the same hand, we're creating a situation because we've pretty much, through regulation, prohibited the banking community from making these small, small dollar, short-term loans. And I think that's, that's part of the problem. We could relieve some of this if, if we could just allow these businesses to, to make these these loans. I led a letter to the Federal Reserve asking the FDIC and FDIC last year to, for both of them to join the OCC in uh, allowing banks once again to make these small dollar short term loans to uh, constituents. So real quickly, uh, Mr. McDonald, um, the FDIC recently accepted comments from stakeholders on small dollar lending. And if the Federal Reserve and FDIC explicitly stated that these loans are allowed, as the OCC did last year, would that encourage banks to get back into the small dollar lending? I would certainly hope so. Yeah, I would too. I think it would resolve some of the concerns that we have to give at least some folks an alternative. Mr. Reeder, um, as you know, Georgia is a hub for fintech and payment processing, and I also co-chair with my uh, colleague uh, from Georgia, uh, Mr. Scott, the FinTech and Payments Caucus. When a bank or credit union partners with a FinTech company to make these loans, do the same consumer protections require or requirements apply if the consumer got the loan directly from the bank? If the consumer received it directly from the bank, yes, the OCC or FDIC or whoever's the examiner in charge would have the same authority over that answer. Even if there's a FinTech involved somewhere in that yes, process? Yes, the, the, the complication here is how the product's structured uh, the, the other avenue for regulators is third-party vendor management, um, which is a tool that bank regulators have. Even in the event that the legal entity is a non-bank, uh, the examiner in charge usually requires third-party vendor management to ensure that certain protections are in place. Okay, thank you. And last question, Mr. McDonald. Um, in your testimony, you discussed a regulatory standbox, which I'm highly in favor of, uh, for banks to test small-dollar consumer loan products. Can you elaborate in the few seconds I have left? Sure. Uh, so if regulatory bodies sort of allowed us to take on more risk without identifying them as high-risk loans, and that's sort of the, the, the problem that we had initially a few years back when we started doing this specific product, the scrutiny came where these loans were given to individuals with significant lower interest rates. And 
they were identified as those high-risk loans. Now, over the years, our regulators have become more comfortable with us managing a portfolio like that within a much larger portfolio. So to your point, yes, a sandbox approach where other community banks can operate in a very comfortable manner will definitely be helpful. The gentleman's Thank time you. has expired. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Virginia, Mrs. Wexton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was glad to hear some testimony about the Military Lending Act, uh, because that is something that really has impacted the people in my district uh, and in Virginia, which is my, the state I'm from. Uh, it was enacted in 2007, and it imposes a 36% interest rate cap for payday loans for active duty service members and their dependents. Uh, but however, with the arrival of Mick Mulvaney and now Director Craninger, the CFPB has decided to suspend MLA compliance supervision, even though federal law clearly directs that they conduct this supervision. Now, this is a big deal for us in Virginia because we have military bases. We don't have really um, payday lending, but as a result, we have twice as many car title lenders. And they set up their, their shop uh, near military bases, near especially Quantico Marine Base, uh, and the Norfolk um, Naval Base. Um, Mr. Peterson, while you were at the CFPB, you worked with the Pentagon to help design MLA regulations, is that correct? Uh, yes, Representative. Okay, and can you describe what you were seeing in terms of the predatory practices that were going on that, that, that you needed to guard against? Sure, we saw a lot of evasion of the, the interest rate cap at, with companies that would redesign their products to get in the nooks and crannies of the rule to try to uh, make triple digit interest rate loans to our military service members in ways that Congress had not uh, intended. And that's why it was so important that we had a tight, well-drafted regulation and also rigorous supervision and enforcement follow-up. So if CFPB is not enforcing these regulations, who is? Well, uh, they are claiming to enforce it. They're not doing preventative supervisory examinations, uh, but the other prudential regulators also have uh, supervisory authority. The Federal Trade Commission also has some enforcement authority, and also service members themselves can also bring private causes of action to enforce those, enforce that law. But it is very troubling that the only regulator that has a federal regulator that has supervisory preventative examination authority over payday lenders is not concluding Military Lending Act compliance over those payday lenders and car title lenders that you just mentioned. That, that's a troubling development. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Standard, uh, I, I was looking at the uh, new Center for Responsible Lending updated uh, report about payday car title lenders draining nearly $8 billion in fees every year. Is that an accurate amount for the fees that, that they're collecting annually? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so this is a very lucrative business model for these operators, is that yes, correct? Yes, and again, 75% of fees collected are due to borrowers stuck in more than 10 loans a year, so the bulk is due to the debt trap. Okay. Now, there are a number of states that have, that have state protections against these payday or car title borrowing uh, debt traps. Um, most of New England uh, has, has enacted such legislation, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey. Uh, what do those people do in those states? Are they able to get credit? Most importantly, the consumers in those states are not um, stuck in the quicksand of the debt trap. And so they have, um, they're protected from these dangers. They have other options from addressing, um, for addressing financial shortfalls, and they're able to move more quickly to pathways of building assets and wealth for the future. And have you, have you observed that the market has responded and that these folks still have access to credit even though they're not, they're not caught in the debt trap? Yes, that's correct. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Meeks, for yielding and for hosting this hearing. I also want to thank all the witnesses for sticking around. We, um, I'm particularly taken, Mr. Sherrill, by your story, and not just because of your background, but also because of the industry that you're in, and that's my family's business that I grew up in. And so I, I appreciate what you do day in and day out, and the customers and their issues and, and the challenges you face, not from a background perspective, but from the business perspective and custodial and janitorial work. It's a tough business. It's a noble business, and I appreciate what you do. 
My family's business started around 1963. It's now in its third generation. So you might have a legacy on your hand. I, um, I wish the best to you. So thanks for what you do. Um, Mr. McDonald, uh, you know, in 2013, the OCC and the FDIC issued guidance placing strict restrictions on banks' ability to offer deposit advanced products. Uh, so how has this decision by the regulators coupled with the current regulatory environment affected your bank's ability to offer small dollar loans to consumers? So over the years, we've become more comfortable uh, in sharing our experience with small dollar loan products with our regulators. And um, as a business model, we actually are okay with doing uh, less than peer group numbers. And so with their approval and with their oversight, we are okay with doing small dollar loans uh, within a certain parameter. So I want to expand this to the, to the panelists. Uh, would you agree that it's good for consumers in an unforeseen situation where they're in immediate needs of funds to allow highly regulated or what we think of as normal banks to offer a small dollar lending product? And uh, if we could just start from the right and go this way, my right. I think, I think it's, it's absolutely right for that to be the case. Um, my only caveat is that banks generally require a credit history and an experience of the borrower. So they'll be able to help out a lot of people if the environment is created for that. But that doesn't mean that some people won't rely on alternative options because they're unbanked or because they uh, do not have the credit score uh, that is sufficient to obtain a loan from a bank. You should. Could you repeat the question for me? Sure. So we're asking if regular or normal banks should be able to offer these small dollar loans. It seems that uh, since 2013, they haven't been able to due to the regulators uh, making a lot of rules where they can't. So just if anybody has an opinion, you'd, if you want to weigh in, great. If you'd like to not weigh in, that's okay as well. But if you have any thoughts, please. I think that if, if they could, they would be doing it by now. I mean... Um, Payday lending in my city is the only thing that's going. I mean, I don't see no, no other alternatives. I keep hearing that word, though, but I don't, I don't know of any. And, you know, I'm a businessman. I'm, 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 I'm smart. I, I can find the money if it's there. It's not there. Thank you. I would support that with the one caveat of the relationship between overdraft uh, and a small dollar credit offered by a bank and sort of how those two interact. But our organization helped design the U.S. bank product. Uh, and I've been a long time supporter of small dollar credit that's bank issued. Good, thank you. Uh, it's simply not accurate to say that banks or credit unions are not offering small dollar loans. In fact, every credit card in America can be used to extend small dollar credit. You just borrow a little bit of money on your credit card. And every credit card in America also includes a free payday loan for borrowers that are not maintaining a balance, a monthly balance, during the grace period. So you can borrow 100 bucks, $150, $200, $300 on your credit card, and then repay that. Now, not everybody has access to credit cards, but banks have done a pretty good job of increasing availability for credit uh, through, for, we have a variety of credit cards that are available out there for uh, uh, people with subprime credit histories, and uh, especially if they're willing to put down a deposit on the card. There's only one alternative, there are lots of others that are out there. So I think that there are plenty of credit opportunities out there uh, across the country, and that's, that's just factually driven um, uh, at interest rates that are below 36%. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, banks should not start acting like the payday lenders on the corner. At the time before the 2013 regulations, those direct deposit advance loans trapped people in, on average, 19 loans in a year at effective rates of 200 to 300% interest rates. And, and, and b those borrowers were also experiencing the harm of overdrafts. So uh, banks should not be in the business of offering harmful small dollar credits and should stay under the 36% rate cap. Thank you. My, my time has nearly expired. I'll finish with this. So continued innovations in financial technology will, in my view, also create more credit opportunities for the consumer, offering them in a product at a lower price point. And I hope this committee can continue to support further development in this space because it should play a continued role in the small dollar space along with banks and payday lenders. I yield to the chairman. Thank you all. Thank you. I now yield uh, to the gentle lady from New York, Mrs. Ms. Velasquez, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member. Uh, Reverend, uh, you mentioned you provide microloans. Have you partnered with SBA? 
Pardon me? Have you partnered with the Small Business Administration? No, we have not. And uh, why is that? Would you like, so the Small Business Administration has a microloan program and they provide money to in intermediaries like you so that you could provide technical assistance to the borrowers because it's not only about providing access to capital but making sure that these individuals will succeed in their enterprises. So I will suggest to you that maybe you should explore that option. Okay, and, and so for the Republicans who are concerned about providing access to capital to uh, low-income communities, they should advise the president not to zero out uh, the micro-lending program that we have under uh, SBA. And Mr. Reader, online lenders, so-called fintech lenders, originated almost $23 billion in small dollar consumer and small business loans in 2015, according to one estimate. And as you know, expansion in this area has been rapid growing 163% between 2011 and 2015. Do you think the current regulatory environment is doing an appropriate job balancing investor protections and access to capital? What possible changes would you make? Thank you for the question. A couple of things. One, I would note that small business credit has unique features in that it does not have the same protections as consumer credit. So in the case of consumer credit, the Truth in Lending Act applies, which requires a set of uh, disclosures and requires a computation of an APR. Mm -hmm. That does not apply to small business credit. I think that that is something that um, should be considered. Uh, on a positive note, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act does apply to small business credit. One, one distinction I would make in this space, which is very important, is that there are lenders and there are merchant cash advance businesses. Lenders are subject to the same laws as others on the state level as being le lenders. Merchant cash advance, advanced businesses in general uh, are not considered lenders for state law, and that creates a, a set of issues from a regulatory standpoint. Thank you. Mr. Peterson, would you like to comment? Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, if there is anything that we should do in the regulatory uh, climate um, to provide investor protections and access to capital, what changes would you make? Uh, to the current regulatory environment? I would recommend uh, expanding the Military Lending Act that's currently functioning and doing a great job for our active duty service members right now and expanding those protections to all Americans all across the country. There'll still be plenty of access to credit uh, and we'll crowd out uh, some of the worst predatory abuses. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reeder, reports indicate that the average online loan carries an interest rate that is much higher that, than compared to a traditional bank loan. Why would a consumer or small business owner use an online lender even when the interest rate exceeds that of a traditional bank loan? A couple answers. Uh, obviously, once again, small business and consumer are different. But I'd say w one of the issues in credit in general is just the ability for consumers to shop. Uh, often consumers don't have the opportunity to compare alternatives, so sometimes that's an issue. The other is that um, the online channel in general is faster, and so many people find that convenience something that they're willing to pay for. So are you concerned about the possible predatory nature of these high interest online loans? Any credit product that ends with a consumer worse off than where they started is a problem. So are you concerned that providing loans of this nature foster an environment similar to the buildup of the subprime mortgage crisis of 2008? I do think that the mortgage crisis is unique in both its scale mm -hmm. uh, and its impact. However, I will say that having large amounts of credit that are not regulated from, from a federal level in the case of the Truth in Lending Act could be problematic. Mr. Peterson? Yeah, I think that online uh, uh, loans, in particular the online payday lending market, is one of the most um, uh, abusive and problematic markets in the country. The average interest rates in the online payday loan market are actually higher than they are in the storefront market. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ms. Tander and um, Mr. Reeder, some have noted that 
online marketplace lending could fail as an industry because these lenders often fail to fully inform borrowers of the terms of the loan and their high interest rates. How can we achieve transparency? How can we uh, make sure that people who are getting money, borrowing money, they know the APR, they know the terms of the loan. Would you support a borrower's, a borrower's bill of rights? What provisions will you seek to include? We're most concerned with the underlying terms of the products and whether or not they're properly priced, properly underwritten, and whether or not they comply with state laws. One of the concerning developments in the marketplace industry is their partnership with out-of-state banks to make loans that are um, at rates higher than what is otherwise allowed by law. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. Thank you. I now recognize the gentlewoman from the great state of Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I want to thank all of you so much for being here. Um, about three-fourths of payday borrowers um, make about $40,000 a year. In my district, that's about 60% of the residents um, essentially being targeted by predatory lenders. Um, many of my neighbors who are single moms, uh, veterans, young professionals burdened by immense student loans, uh, teachers, and so forth, all throughout my Wayne County community. And one of the things that we're seeing is that pay payday loan establishments pop up in the corners of my district, but literally at the doorsteps of communities, and especially communities of color where there's concentrated poverty. Um, and when Mr. Sherrill, when you talk about there was no other option, I just want you to know, you know, I think government is about people and it's about us creating those options uh, that are better than this, but also um, ensuring that there is some sort of regulation and oversight of practices that are really fed through corporate greed. Right? Uh, corporate greed leads to unjust practices that hurt residents, especially when they're pushed more into poverty. And every time I see my residents kind of stuck um, and they have these flashy signs and come on in, we'll take care of you. Uh, at the end, as soon as the sign, they don't take care of them. They don't help them. Not like credit unions and not like the reverend's um, services through, uh, you know, incredible service that you're doing through residents. So it's really important that when we talk about there is no other options, it is our job to create those options uh, for you. My question, and really, you know, C CFPB has decided to aid in what I call legal robbery by proposing a rule that will drain our communities for, of their hard-earned savings instead of developing a system that helps the most vulnerable. And as you know, that, so in 2017 payday lending rule, they prevented so preventing the debt de traps that we're talking about. And this is something that I really want to focus on in this committee hearing. Um, we should not be subjecting families to that. And so, you know, Mr. Reeder, what kind of harm would low and moderate consumers, particularly communities, could be exposed if CFPB's uh, current proposal is finalized? In full disclosure, I, I was at the CFPB and I was chief of staff during a period in which the rulemaking was underway. So I want to be very clear about that. So um, I, I do think that the rule offers enormous opportunity, probably once in a decade or maybe once in a generation, to put protections in place that really do weigh access uh, and protection. And that without that, many of us will be back in this room 10 years from now or 20 years from now having the same discussion when many of the, the, the uh, opportunities we have in front of us are quite evident and we spent almost a decade here in Washington working this out, and, and Mr. Peterson here would know better than me, he helped write the rule. Um, but that is something where there will be a great missed opportunity if we are unable to move forward. Thank you, and you know, um, Mr. Whitaker, you and I have worked on grassroots uh, advocacy on just the amount of what poverty from water shutoffs to ensuring that we have a right to breathe clean air and so forth. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, we're the government, the public, I always feel like is stuck subsidizing the cycle of poverty that is created by practices like that. Does that make sense? So when, when we don't do our job in this end in preventing um, folks to be chained, as the Reverend called, uh, called it, or be held back, and that's what it is by not cr creating alternative options, um, we, the public, is subsidizing that poverty. Can you talk a little bit about, because you are from the city I grew up in, I mean, talk about what that looks like um, from the ground up, because I see it in our school system, I see it in so many ways of how poverty uh, is costing us more money on the other end uh, and trying to provide all these other services. Thank you, Rep. Talib. When we divest resources from these communities, 
Uh, we, we don't support our schools. We, we close down community banks. We divest in community development. Um, and then we see these institutions throughout our community. Um, and then we say that this is the most affordable and safest option. Well, I, I, w I would challenge you, representatives, that this, if this is the most affordable uh, and safest option, then um, I would say that it's evidence of a decade, decades of failure by the people that we elect to make decisions for us. I agree with you, Rep. Tlaib, that it is your job to create these options as this country moves forward. If you look and you see that there's nobody at the wheel, then you take the wheel. I'll end this by saying that if you continue to keep the lights off, the roaches will continue to feast on the crumbs of this country that you've created. Thank you so much. And I just would end, you know, close to 80 percent of Americans live check paycheck by paycheck. And many of you at this table know that. Um, you know, I have the third poorest congressional district in the country, and one in every two households will face some sort of burden of unexpected financial emergency. And this should not be their last option. We should be, again, working together to provide alternatives and supporting what you're doing, Reverend, in Texas. So I, again, really appreciate it, and I lead the rest, yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. I now recommend, uh, uh, now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who's also the chair for the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this hearing has been informative, but it's also been painful. And it's been painful because you and I know that most poor people who cannot get a payday loan do not take to the streets. That is highly inflammatory language. It is designed to say to white people, black people who don't get payday loans are likely to engage in criminal conduct. Poor people across the length and breadth of this country suffer in poverty without committing crimes. And to imply that if you can't get a payday loan, you're likely to take to the streets. That's a painful thing to hear. And it's regrettable, to be quite candid with you, that it's been said. So Mr. Sherrill, so you want to play this game, let me play with you. Did you get your pardon from Donald Trump yet? You asked me the question? Yes, sir. I wish. You know you, you did request one, didn't you? I'm working on it. That's right. You're working on a pardon. And there's a reason for that. How many felonies did you have? State or federal? I have both. This call that you, you, I mean, you, I don't know you determine. You, I need to understand. The reason we're doing it, let me just share this with you. Ordinarily, I would not do this. But for you to do what you have done. What is that? To, to imply that people of color, because you happen to be a person of color, to imply that if you can't get a payday loan, you will take to the streets. That, that was my circumstance. That's sir. for you. But don't, don't imply that that's the only option for people. That's for the most of the people that I know. Well, but not for the most of the people in this country. I that's what only, you have done. I can only speak from my experience. Well, you can speak for I'm your doing. experience, but you ought not try to put that experience on other people. They know this, it this what you have done, sir, is shameful. The Just truth take can it never to be the shameful. Streets. The truth can never be shameful. The truth is shameful when you exaggerate and you try to pretend that it's more than what it is. Poor people are not criminals just because they are poor. I didn't say that. But that's what the implication is. If you can't get the loan, you're going to take to the streets. That's what I would have done. Well, that, that's why you went to jail. Exactly. Uh, well, look, don't, speak for, other, don't speak for other poor people. And I've changed my life too, sir. Well, I'm glad you did. Look, let me pardon, commend you for that. Tennessee let me commend me. you for that. I commend you for changing yeah. your life. Yeah. And I commend you for getting the pardons. But I would ask you, dear sir, don't use that highly inflammatory language in such a general way. 
I'm just because it because it well, but what you're doing is causing white people to believe that black people are going to take to the streets that they can't get a payday loan. Anybody. Therefore, we should not regulate payday lending. Everybody Excuse uses me. these products. Let me go on to something else. We don't want to see this invidious discrimination that takes place with reference to these loans. These lenders locate in black communities. They charge black communities more for their loans than they do in other communities. If you walk into a lender's, a payday lender shop, one person black and one white, both equally qualified, would you expect them to get the same type of treatment, Mr. Sherrill? Of course. Okay. And if one is discriminated against, would you condone that? Of course not. All right. Then that's one of the things that we are talking about how these lenders discriminate and they charge black people more in fees and products than they charge white people. That's, that's, that happens. So if you locate on one side of town and you charge more than you charge on another side of town, that too is a problem. I'm not saying to you that all payday lenders are loan sharks, but a good many are. They have found a way to feast on the poor, the underprivileged, and people who are trying to make it, who do not take to the streets. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Gentlemen's time has expired. Let me take this opportunity to really thank all of our panel members. Uh, I know Mr. Whitaker had to step out uh, for an emergency, uh, but I did want to get into the record. You know, when I listen to all of the witnesses, I think that we've got a extremely diverse ideas and thought patterns and moving forward to try to figure out how do we remedy this problem. I didn't hear anyone, as I stated in my opening, say that we need to get rid of payday lenders. We said we need to get rid of the predatory payday lenders, of those that are doing things that are ripping people off, where you get caught into the uh, never-ending debt. And I think that there is a lesson to be learned, and I think this is not whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, that we need to do and make sure that we take care of all consumers. I heard someone talk about how we take care of the military, and we cap it at 36%. I heard Reverend Hayes says he thought that that might be reasonable uh, in response to a question from Chairwoman Waters. <clears throat> I think that's something that we need to look at and be able to figure out in a bipartisan way. I heard and I think Mr. Sherrill, the fact that you were able to turn your life around is admirable. I also think that Mr. Whitaker is admirable for what he has done with his kids trying to fight for them and to make a better life, and from his experience, never forgetting who he is, going around the country fighting for equality and racial justice, uh, organizing people, because it could have been very easy that he could have just given up and said nothing. So I want to thank particularly the two individuals that have had different experiences with payday lending, Mr. Whitaker and Mr. Sherrill. But I would not let this go without Mr. Whitaker being thanked personally also because of who he is, his background, and his children with him, who uh, clearly he wants to make sure that they have a better life. I want to thank the experts, and Reverend, what you do on a regular basis is important. And what you're doing, Ms. Staddard, and Mr. McDonald, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Rita, and Mr. Uh, Zuluaga, thank you. It's what makes us who we are. Uh, ending debt traps in the payday and small dollar credit industry is important. It's ensuring that our constituents have access to affordable, I think that's what we're talking about, non-predatory financial products, because I believe that's essential. Members of the subcommittee and witness today have pointed to several data points that confirm but many of us know from our daily engagement with constituents and families we represent. The scope of unbanked 
and underbanked Americans is grave and should concern us all. The growth of banking deserts should worry us all. And the extent of financial vulnerability for the American households is on the top of mind of this subcommittee. And I know also of the overall committee under the leadership of Chairwoman Maxine Waters. Today, in addition to the testimony of, of the panel of witnesses, we've considered a discussion draft of legislation to set a national usury rate at 36%. Legislation introduced by Mr. Scott to establish an office for underbanked and unbanked and underserved consumers at the CFPB. And a letter to appropriate to appropriators, which I led, requesting funding for the small dollar loan program under Section 1206 of the Dodd-Frank Act. These are important issues for us to consider. Ensuring access to fair and affordable financial products and protecting consumers from dead traps is and should be a priority. And I look forward to working uh, with all of you on these continued, on these critical issues. I also, without objection, will submit for the record uh, letters uh, from the American Financial Services Association uh, and from MasterCard uh, in support of uh, the letter to appropriations to invest in low loss reserves to enable more than, more than 1,000 CDFs to participate. Without objection, submitted to the record. All members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able, and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials for the chair for inclusion in the record. This hearing is now adjourned.